Hi, everyone. On behalf of the Southeast New England Program Network, welcome to our webinar titled Emerging Stormwater Technologies in Rhode Island, the Jellyfish Filter Webinar, brought to you by the Providence Stormwater Innovation Center. My name is Leah Soloway from the New England Environmental Finance Center, and I'll be assisting with logistics for today's program, along with Tess Clark from the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. Now, in case you haven't heard of the SNEP Network before, um, the SNEP Network's mission is to empower communities to achieve healthy watersheds, sustainable financing, and long-term climate resilience through the management of stormwater and restoration projects. We focus on building local capacity by providing no-cost trainings, webinars, and technical assistance to communities in the SNEP region. If you'd like to learn more, please visit snepnetwork.org for more information. And now before we begin the webinar, there are a few logistics to keep in mind. First, everyone will be on mute to ensure audio quality. You'll be able to ask questions by typing them into the questions box on your GoToWebinar control panel. We look forward to answering questions, so please type them in at any time. Additionally, you can request a certificate of attendance for joining this webinar. Information on how to do so will be available in our follow-up email after the webinar. We also have closed captions available for today's webinar. To view the closed captions, um, please click the link in the chat. And also over in the control panel under handouts, we have the presentations available for you to download. And on that note, I'd like to hand things over to Ryan Kopp, the Stormwater Coordinator with the Audubon Society of Rhode Island to introduce our pre presenters for today's webinar. Okay, thank you, Leah, and thank you, Tess, for all of your help uh, in the background with technical support for this webinar. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with the Providence Stormwater Innovation Center, we started about two years ago after the City of Providence uh, implemented around 40 stormwater BMPs in Roger Williams Park in Providence. And so we've spent the last two years um, using these BMPs to monitor them, to research them, to try to better, better understand their function and performance and their overall effectiveness on water quality. Uh, we also use the BMPs for public outreach and education uh, by implementing educational signage, giving tours, and hosting various events and festivals. And then we also organize trainings and webinars like this uh, to bring together experts in the field and have them share their information, their knowledge, and lessons learned about stormwater and green infrastructure. So today's webinar uh, is on the jellyfish filter, and we hope this is the first of a series of webinars related uh, in collaboration with uh, Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management, uh, going through some of their recently approved stormwater technologies. Uh, so today's presenters are listed here. If you do want a full, uh, to view their full bios, uh, that is available at the URL right there on the on this slide. Uh, but Brian Burns with the Providence Park Department will be talking uh, about a future conceptual plan in Roger Williams Park to install a jellyfish filter and use it as a training site for maintenance of jellyfish filters. Uh, then Chris Bill will be with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. We'll be talking about uh, their approval process with these new proprietary stormwater technologies. And then uh, uh, Derek Berg with Contact Engineered Solutions will really be getting into the details about the jellyfish filter technology and some of the best practices when, when implementing and designing for the jellyfish filter. And then Hernan Peralta of Woodard and Curran and Brian Giroux of Deprete Engineering uh, will give some examples and case studies of projects that they have worked on uh, in Rhode Island already using the jellyfish filter. So uh, we will break these presentations up uh, with some question and answer. So uh, as Leah said, at any time, type your questions into the question and answer section, and we will be able to, I think we'll have plenty of time to answer them. And with that, I will hand it over to our first presenter, Brian Burns. Thank you, Ryan. Um, as Brian said, I'm, my name is Brian Burns. I'm the Deputy Superintendent of Parks in Providence, Rhode Island, and a proud member of the Providence Stormwater Innovation Center. And we are interested in a jellyfish filter for a situation we have here in Roger Williams Park. 
Um, a little bit about Roger Williams Park. Um, in this, the screen here, you'll see that the lower section is the park itself, the park proper. And the upper left-hand side of this screen, you'll see um, Mashapog Pond, which is fed by a pond called Spectable, Spectacle Pond and Tongue Pond. These are all ponds that have impaired waterways. So they're um, rich with phosphorus and nitrogen and other things. So when the water leaves Mashapog Pond, it finds its way through a pipe that goes through a couple different municipalities and ends up in the inlet shown here, um, going into Roger Williams Park. So that's a 48-inch 48 48-inch pipe that um, brings all that impaired water here and has for many, many, many years. So not only do we have a problem with the water coming into the park, but we also have a problem with the uh, water that's hit here now and um, the sediment in the ponds themselves are embedded with phosphorus and nitrogen, and the end result of that is uh, cyanobacteria. So um, this is a very active park. We have a lot of people that fish here, that we have swan boats, we have kayaking, we have all sorts of water sports that take place here. And so certainly from a public safety um, stance, we need to do better with our water quality. So we can put as many signs up as we want, but the reality is people are gonna do what they do. And we need to make sure that when they come in contact with the waters in Roger Williams Park, that they're safe. So to that end, we are continually looking to improve our water quality and removing the phosphorus and nitrogen and other contaminants that uh, make its way into our water. So getting back to the pond, and, and I will apologize for my rudimentary um, drawing here. It's not the fact that I am not good at CAD or didn't have time to, but it's a, it tells a better story. It tells a story about the Stormwater Innovation Center and what it is. So this is literally a drawing that we made in a conversation with some of the, the great members of the Stormwater Center, UNH and URI and DEM and DOT. So the basic, basic function would be the pipe comes in from Mashapog, it goes through a couple testing ports, it goes through the jellyfish filter, which we hope will remove most of the phosphorus that's connected to sediment, because that and again, I'm not going to speak to the engineering of this because there's much more talented people than me on this call. But what we believe will happen is the phosphorus that's connected to sediment will be removed with a jellyfish filter. We are actually calling this a treatment train. We're going to have a secondary um, facility that, that we can put different types of uh, removal systems in as, we, as they are developed and as we choose. We're thinking we're going to start out with biochar, so many of you may know that, but it'll basically be a concrete structure that we put biochar in and we test that out for a couple of years and then we may go on to the next thing. I'm hoping that somebody invents um, a filter made of mattresses because we are full of mattresses that have discarded on the streets of Providence that we clean up all the time. And if we can find a way to utilize them, we'd be doing, doing pretty well. So again, just from a conversation with a couple of experts and researchers, we developed this philosophy and, and this intent to do this. The reason was and why we led ourselves to the jellyfish filter is because real estate was at a premium. There's not a lot of area between our property line and where this pipe comes into the pond itself. So the jellyfish filter can be used in a very small area. So this would actually be installed in line in that pipe, in line with the treatment train, with overflows and bypasses that allow us to deal with the bigger storm events. But in the end, this facility will be right next to Roosevelt Pond. Up on high, higher from Roosevelt Pond is our casino. There was never any gambling had at the casino, but um, we do a lot of trainings with the Stormwater Center at the casino. So the hope is um, to not only install this and get the contaminant removal, but also to provide training and some research about how this functions and the what is needed to maintain them. So the Rhode Island Department of Transportation has several of these jellyfish filters installed. As you can imagine, they're installed in highways and not a great place to have a training. So it was a dual cause for us. One, we want the contaminant removal. Two, we want to be able to provide training to a brother agency that, that really needs it. So that's kind of why we came to the jellyfish filter um, option. And we think that the treatment train will provide us the contaminant removal that we need and also um, provide a training opportunity for around DOT. So that's the mission of the Stormwater Center, provide opportunities for all stakeholders to share in their challenges, issues, and struggles. Uh, we know that bad construction can be difficult, 
in the actual construction and the maintenance. That bad construction, if it's not done right, leads to poor performance, and poor performance ultimately leads to poor water quality. So that's all the things we're looking at here at the Stormwater Center and why we do the things that we do. The jellyfish option, not only is a phosphorus removal, but it's a training opportunity. The biochar um, is modular, so we can retrofit it, as we said. But ultimately, working together leads to better ways to manage stormwater, and that's what we do here at the Providence Stormwater Innovation Center. So reach out to us at stormwaterinnovation.org and let us know if we can help in any way and provide us with the information that you've been gathering about what you've been doing in your home or municipality. So um, with that, I'm gonna pass it on to Chris Dill from the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. Chris. I'm coming, hold on, sorry. Hey, hey everyone, um, do you see my screen? Um, um. All right, so um, my name is uh, Christopher Dill. Uh, I engineer with the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. Um, sorry, the screen is blocking the presentation from me. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so like I said, I work for the DEM and um, today I'll be presenting about proprietary stormwater treatment technologies in Rhode Island and um, you know how vendors apply, how we review them and certify them. So um, who is responsible for reviewing and certifying these proprietary stormwater treatment technologies in Rhode Island? Um, that is the responsibility of the Rhode Island Technology Review Committee, which consists of Eric Beck, Nick Pisani, and myself from DEM, along with Elisa Richardson from Rhode Island DOT and Ross Singer from the CRMC. So, um, are there different types of stormwater treatment technology certifications in Rhode Island? Um, yes, is the short answer. So there are three different types. Um, the first one is a retrofit device, which is basically just, um, you know, something making a old or poorly designed or maintained site better, um, you know, and we're pretty flexible on our minimum standards and BMP performance criteria for this um, because, you know, it is still an improvement at the end of the day. And ideally, um, on these retrofit projects, we'd like to see at least 50% of the water quality volume being captured and treated. Um, but like I said, we are more flexible on those, um, the performance criteria for pollutant removals. Um, next, we have pretreatment devices, um, and these are used to protect water quality BMPs from getting clogged with things like sediment um, and trash. And um, we require that any proprietary pretreatment device that gets approved has to show at least 25% or greater removal of total suspended solids. Um, <clears throat> you know, and these can also be used as retrofit devices. Um, they're not going to get nutrient removal or necessarily bacteria removal either, but it will still, um, you know, be an improvement, like I said. So that's why it can be used as a retrofit. Um, and another note for pretreatment devices, um, previously we allowed them to be used as oil water separators as well if they had greater than 500 gallons of hydrocarbon storage, um, but we are no longer allowing that anymore um, because of some recent discoveries that we've made. Um, and last, you have water quality BMPs, which are the, uh, you know, that's the highest level of certification. For a device um, and they must provide at least 85% um, removal of TSS, 60% for pathogens, and then 30% for total nitrogen and total phosphorus. Um, and vendors can also, um, if they can prove with adequate testing that they can get higher pollutant removals, 
Um, so for example, the jellyfish, I believe, is approved for 50% um, phosphorus removal. Um, they can do that. And also we can they can get approvals for other things such as um, other pollutants like metals. Um, And down at the bottom, there is the uh, application form that vendors have to fill out um, and submit to us to start the application process for a technology. Um, moving on, um, how does the application and review process work for these proprietary stormwater treatment devices in Rhode Island? So it starts out with the vendor um, going out and getting third party verified uh, tape or tarp testing. Um, I'll explain what those mean um, in a few slides. So they get some testing for their device that shows that they get the um, pollutant removals that we require. Um, they fill out the application form that I showed the link to on the last slide, and then they submit the uh, necessary materials that are specified in that application form to us. Um, and then the Rhode Island Technology Review Committee, we review the application for completeness. Um, the vendor has an option to give us a presentation on their technology if they so choose. Then um, the TRC evaluates the submittal and determines if the requirements are adequately met. And from that point, we issue comments and request additional info from the vendor if necessary. Um, and then once we issue our comments, the vendor has the opportunity to pr provide um, responses. And um, if they're not satisfactory, then we're going to issue more comments and we're going to keep doing that until the vendor can provide satisfactory um, responses or device, their device just won't get certified. If they do provide um, adequate responses, then the TRC finalizes the certification conditions, which include um, sizing of the devices to make sure that they treat the water quality volume adequately without um, bypassing first, um, things like maintenance and reporting as well. Um, and then from there, we issue the uh, technology certification for that device, and that is valid for five years. Once we issue the certification, uh, from that point, we hold training sessions just like this one um, for um, review staff in Rhode Island, um, designers, municipalities, and potentially maintenance providers um, down the road. So pretty promising stuff. And then, like I said, I was going to explain tape and TARP. So tape is the technology assessment protocol for the Washington Department of Ecology. Um, they're pretty much the gold standard for um, testing requirements for the stormwater treatment devices. Um, TARP is the Technology Acceptance Reciprocity Partnership, which consists of a few states throughout the country. Um, I believe Massachusetts, New Jersey, Virginia, California, and a few others. Um, that kind of fizzled out, so it's not really as relevant nowadays. Um, and another thing I should mention too is that a lot of the pretreatment devices have been going through the New Jersey DEP for their um, certification on the TSS removal um, because they have a, they're another um, good program that uh, you know has been doing a lot of good work. So um, applicants that don't have um, a tape or tarp certification already, um, they have the opportunity to sub submit reports and materials um, to us that are that have to be essentially on par with the tape requirements. Um, and that's specified in Appendix J of the manual for stormwater in Rhode Island. Um, but you know this is really not the best process to go through. Um, we have limited staff, so conducting a full-on review of a technology like this would be um, a pretty big challenge to take on for us. So that's, it's best to have vendors get that tape or New Jersey certification um, just so that they can get reciprocity and streamline the process. Um, some requirements for reporting on the vendor. Um, <clears throat> They have to, uh, the applicant can request a maintenance schedule after the first year of operation. Um, if the technology gets transferred to a different owner, they have to let us know any device um, design changes or O&M model name number changes, um, system failures along with why it happened and how they fixed it. And then annually re we require um, a list of all installs in Rhode Island um, with, you know, the represent representative who was there to make sure that it was installed correctly um, and a listing of any maintenance providers that they may have trained. 
Um, after that five year period, once it runs out, once their certification runs out, they can get recertified. Um, they have to have adequate reporting throughout their certification period um, and provide us with any additional studies, testing or certifications. And if they have any previous um, certifications that got expired or revoked, then um, that can potentially lead to some issues because we still need to have them show that they still meet the um, requirements from our rules. Um, so another question you might be having is what does a Rhode Island stormwater technology certification look like um, and what info does it contain? So I'll be opening that up right here. Um, and as you can see, you got the Rhode Island DEM header, stormwater technology program. Uh, this is the letter for um, the jellyfish filter, which we are going to be talking about today. Um, it has all the vendor vendor info when it um, was issued and expires. Um, then we kind of talk about how um, the device and its technology application fits into our rules. Um, how it differs from standard BMPs described in our stormwater rules. Um, and then we also explain, you know, what testing was done by who, um, when it was done, and what, um, and basically how, again, it fits into our, our requirements and why we were able to accept it. Um, and right here we have the pollutant removals that it's approved for. Right there, you can see, like I mentioned, the jellyfish is approved for 50%, which is more than the 30% minimum that we require for phosphorus. Um, get into some general certification requirements, just making sure that they install it properly and um, you know, use all the right materials and whatnot. Um, has to be sized to treat the water quality volume. And we kind of explain a little bit of the sizing as well. Um, can get into that a little bit later. With the sizing table um, and then you know we have the maintenance requirements right here um, all proprietary water quality bmps have to be the entire device system has to be maintained once a year and then their sump um, which is required for all these devices they have to have some sort of sump or upstream manhole to collect sediment um, that has to be cleaned out um, whenever it gets more than half clogged or at least twice a year it has to get inspected um, there's the reporting requirements that I was talking about earlier, um, and then some other general language. You can see Eric's signature right there. And here's the sizing table that I was talking about. So you have the different jellyfish models, the approximate impervious catchment areas that can that they are able to treat without bypassing, um, and then the associated water quality flow rate that they're able to treat. So um, for this model right here, if say you had a third of an acre of a parking lot you needed to treat, um, you would go with the JF421 and that would handle it and it would be able to treat that water quality flow rate. Um, and here you have the different size filters um, with their different flow rates. Um, this table right here is based on the largest size filter, but um, there's some other language in the certification that explains how you could um, figure out the water quality flow rates for the smaller filters. Um, and then there's just some uh, general details at the bottom. Um, all right, moving on. Um, so some uh, currently certified technologies in Rhode Island for BMPs, we have the Filtera, the Jellyfish, the Focal Point, and the Kraken. And then for pretreatment and retrofit devices, we have Storm Scepter, Hydro Storm, Cascade Separator, Continuous Deflective Separator, also known as CDS, and Cyclone X. Um, and we are also in the process of reviewing the recertification application for the Modular Wetlands um, System Linear, which is a, another BMP that was previously certified in Rhode Island. Um, and you know, this is proprietary technologies and just stormwater treatment in general are pretty new topics um, generally speaking so it's it's an evolving world and um, just some things to keep on the radar uh, epa hasn't developed um, performance curves for these proprietary technologies yet but um, hopefully that's something that they can move forward on in the future um, also astm is 
Uh, I'm working on developing some standard specifications and requirements for these proprietary stormwater treatment devices. Um, I believe Jamie Houle from UNH is going to be pretty heavily involved in that. And then, um, you know, another thing to mention is that we will be holding more training webinars on other approved technologies um, in, you know, the DEM and Audubon Society and uh, the Stormwater Center and SNEP will hopefully be collaborating on more of these um, trainings. So I hope you enjoy it. And I guess we'll uh, open that up to questions now. And there's also my contact information. Um, if any, if anyone has any questions about proprietary technologies uh, in Rhode Island, um, I'd be the person to reach out to. So thank you. Okay. Yeah, it looks like we do have a couple of questions, but uh, feel free to uh, type them in the questions section if you have them. Uh, here's one that says, uh, who is responsible for uh, enforcement that installed technologies are being maintained properly after they are installed? Or does does that exist even? Um, sort of... So the, the question was, who's in charge of enforcing the maintenance? Yeah. Or is there any enforcement? So as of right now, um, for all proprietary technologies that we approve, we are um, water quality BMPs specifically, um, not so much pretreatment devices. Um, we are requiring that the applicant for each project submits a two-year um, maintenance agreement with a maintenance provider that has been certified by the um, by that vendor, saying that they are capable of maintaining that device. So. It's at least two years into it. Um, enforcing maintenance has always been a challenge for a lot of um, agencies, and that's definitely something that we're gonna have to pay attention to and try and take care of in the future. But like I said, for right now, we have the, the two-year maintenance contract, which is a pretty good start. And uh, okay. Eric, I don't know if you wanted to speak on that at all. Did you say my name or Eric, apologize. We got one other question here that I can, unless Eric, you have anything more that you want to add? Okay, here's the other question. It is uh, how successful are the recertifications after five years? Are certifications frequently revoked after those five years? Maybe just how, how common does that happen? I think you're muted, Chris. Um, yeah, so I actually got started at DM about a year and a half ago when we kind of rebooted this um, technology review process. And prior to that, um, the last round of certifications was about five years earlier. So the jellyfish um, had got recertified. And like I said, we're working on the modular wetlands recertification right now. Um, those are the only two BMPs that were certified at the time. Um, getting the jellyfish recertified, um, Definitely took a little bit of a while because, like I said, we were rebooting the program, so we wanted to make sure that we were doing everything um, properly. Um, and we are also having some hiccups with the uh, modular wetlands, um, but that's just, you know, like I said, doing our due diligence and making sure that um, all the boxes are checked and making sure that we fully understand these technologies and how they work and making sure that they get designed properly. Um, but I believe that the two devices that were previously certified as BMPs. Um, like I said, the jellyfish is already recertified and the MWS is on the way. Um, and actually another thing that comes to mind is the storm scepter was another one that was previously certified. And um, that recertification turnover is pretty quick because the um, pretreatment in general just tends to be a lot faster of a process than the BMPs. Um, because we're, you know, it's like I explained in the slides, it's there's a lot more that we ask for for um, BMPs to to do for treatment, so. Okay, that's all we have for questions right now. Uh, so yeah, if we want to move on to Derek Berg and his presentation, and we can, we will, we have plenty of time at the end and in, after uh, Derek's presentation to, for more questions, so feel free to type them in. All right, you guys see my screen okay? Yep. Perfect. Well, hello, everybody. I really appreciate uh, you all taking the time to be here and also appreciate having the opportunity to participate and 
uh, certainly thankful for all of the, the participants and folks partnering to uh, put this together and most importantly thankful for DEM and, and uh, Rhode Island DOT and CRMC for uh, rebooting this process. Um, it's literally uh, not entirely but it's a lot of what I do as a uh, you know, director of uh, our regulatory operations for the eastern half of the country at Contech. Uh, a lot of my time is spent interfacing with programs uh, just like this working towards working on product reviews and approvals and uh, sitting on a lot of stakeholder committees. I'm actually part of the uh, ASTM group that Chris mentioned, and I'll just give a quick plug to that, is that it is very active. Jimmy Hula is definitely a part of it, among a number of other uh, set of movers and shakers in the in the stormwater world. And the, the end game um, for some of the initial standards that are going through that program is to kind of feed into what's hopefully going to become a national verification process for innovative technologies and uh, their grander vision is that it would be applicable to all technologies, but I think there's a recognition that um, resources are limited, and in a lot of states, there just aren't, uh, there isn't time or, or expertise to go through a vetting process of technologies like these. So, uh, most importantly, you know, it's refreshing that Rhode Island recognized that you know site constraints happen. Uh, that's where these types of innovative systems come into play. Um, we can often uh, work around different constraints, fit into a smaller footprint and things like that. So today I'm gonna to spend the bulk of my time uh, just getting into some nuts and bolts on what the jellyfish filter is, how it works, some of the kind of core processes and components. Um, I'll get into a little bit of a primer on, on how systems like this are sized and um, as well as talk a little bit about performance data and a quick overview on, on some maintenance basics, but. Uh, We'll get too deep on any of that today, but I think there is a nice chunk of, of time allotted at the end of this session for questions. So don't hesitate to type away as we're rolling along and uh, we'll get to as many of those as we can. And if not during the, uh, the Q&A, uh, I know I'll certainly do my best to, to follow up on anything applicable to, to me specifically after the fact. So get rolling. Uh, I thought it'd be a good place to start. Just talk a little bit about you know surface or membrane filtration versus bed filtration. Um, the jellyfish filter is a membrane filter. Um, you've probably heard of some of the other filters. We actually have uh, another filter in our repertoire that is a bed filtration system. Um, jellyfish filter is a cartridge filter with pleated membranes in it. And uh, you know, one of the things about membranes is they, uh, they do a very nice job of filtering out fine particulate. Um, jellyfish filter is a passive system, so it's not targeting any sort of dissolved pollutants. Um, you heard Brian talking about you know tar targeting particulate, but uh, you know that's exactly the kind of application jellyfish is best suited for is particulate and particulate bound pollutants. Whereas if we're talking about a bed or or, or media filter, we can often customize that type of solution. You know, if we get into more specialized situations, um, we're looking at dissolved metals or nutrients or things of that nature. So with membranes, one of the kind of core principles to keep in mind is that. You know, you're doing most of your filtration at the surface. You often have, have a pretty fine uh, interface that that's filters out particulate and lets the water pass through that membrane, uh, and it builds up a surface cake. And uh, you know, the nice thing about a a surface cake is it actually makes the filter improve functionally improve as far as its ability to remove particulate over time. Uh, but we're going to be very mindful of clogging during the design, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. You know, whereas with a bed filter, you get a little more leniency. As far as clogging goes, you've got uh, you know, interstitial spaces between the media, and you've got uh, ability for particulate to accumulate within the media bed itself. Um, you, you often can size those at a little bit higher hydraulic loading rate, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a bit about more how that kind of plays out in filter sizing in a minute. So, a little bit more detail about the jellyfish. Uh, over on the right side of this slide uh, is a jellyfish cartridge. And uh, you know, taking a look at it, it, you can start to get a get a handle on why it has the name it does. Um, we've got these pleated filter tentacles, if you will, uh, very similar to an air filter, but these ones are long and skinny, uh, pleated membrane, and the really the whole point of those pleats is to maximize the amount of surface area in a given footprint. Um, if you were to take a, a 54 inch long jellyfish cartridge, there's 11 of those pleated tentacles on each cartridge. They all thread into a, a base plate, if you will, that's installed in the deck in the system. And uh, there is actually a flow controlled uh, orifice plate on the top of each cartridge. So we regulate how much flow can get through each cartridge. And the reason for that 
is that uh, with filters, the way they're typically tested in design is to establish a maximum flux rate or hydraulic loading rate uh, that they can operate at and meet their performance objectives, as well as you know have a, a reasonable amount of longevity out in the field. So with jellyfish, we have some different sizes and it really comes down to do you have depth on your site? Um, if you've got the depth to go to 54 inch, that's going to be often your most economical option because you know quick rule of thumb is the deeper we can go the smaller we can make the horizontal footprint so you know if we had to use a 15 inch long cartridge instead of a 54 um you know you're approaching a 4x increase in the number of cartridges that would have to go into a vault to treat the same amount of water so the the vault obviously is going to have to get a much, much bigger for that uh, you see a little bit here about you know high flow and drain down. I wanted to explain that, and we're going to see some graphics and video that that get into that a bit more. But the jellyfish actually has a passive back flush mechanism in it. You know, so at the end of each operating cycle, um, the system actually back flushes water through uh, most of the cartridges in an effort to uh, maintain hydraulic capacity, knock some of that accumulated uh, debris and cake sediment off the surface of the system. It is passive, it's not pressurized, but uh, it does uh, help extend the longevity. Um, but the drain down cartridges, there's at least one, often more than one drain down cartridge in every system. And uh, you'll get to see how that works, but those are capped at 50% of the hydraulic capacity. And uh, the reason for that is if the drain down cartridges were to clog before um, you know, the rest of the system reached the end of their useful life, uh, the back flush mechanism wouldn't work properly. So we restrict those to uh, add some some longevity to the drain down cartridges. Similarly, you see that there's a table, a yeah, column on the right side of this table that lists sediment capacity per cartridge. And uh, that also factors into sizing, and I'm gonna I'll talk more about that in a minute, but we don't just look at flow capacity. Uh, filters are, are much less sensitive to flow than say a sedimentation devices, like some of the pre-treated practices. You know, you can ramp up the flow on the filter and still hit your performance goals, but where you usually suffer is in the, on the longevity side of things. Um, so in a lot of applications, filters end up getting installed, installed downstream of, of some sort of detention or attenuation where you can really ratchet down the flow. Uh, in those situations, we don't just look at flow, we, we wanna look at how much mass is potentially associated with that water quality volume and uh, make sure we've got enough cartridges to provide reasonable amount of, of longevity given the amount of mass we're going to treat. So typical system, you kind of saw a few of these graphics. I think Brian had one. Um, don't feel like you need to figure it all out on this graphic. I'm going to get into more details on the, uh, the individual functional or, or the individual components of the system. But you can see this is a typical uh, manhole jellyfish filter system. Flows coming in through an inlet on the left side. Um, flows into this, this little pool. We call that the maintenance observation wall. Um, or maintenance access wall, excuse me, because we do provide overhead access directly to that space. Um, so you can insert a, a vector hose directly into the sump of the system and back it out. Um, that's also where all of our floatables, any floating trash or debris or oil is gonna accumulate right in that space. And uh, it serves to provide some pretreatment to the cartridges themselves. Flow is then gonna go down below the cartridge deck. The core solids actually settle out into the sump of this system without ever making it to the filter. So it's got a built-in pre-treatment component to it. Um, these systems are designed typically with about 18 inches of driving head across the system. And uh, one of the very nice things about working with a membrane cartridge versus working with a media cartridge is that when it comes time to install and or maintain these systems, uh, these membrane cartridges are much, much lighter than say a, a wet uh, sediment caked media cartridge you know, that often is gonna require uh, lifting equipment to get it out of the vault. You know, jellyfish cartridges, even when wet and fully, uh, you know, sort of utilized, um, we can uh, pull those out just with the basic maintenance per personnel and you don't need specialized lifting equipment. So that's one of the big differences between, say, this system and a, a media filled cartridge, which we do offer as well. So I'm going to fire on a, um, an animation clip for you in a minute, and I'm going to pause it a couple of times along the way. But uh, this just gives you another look before I start it up. You can see the inlet on the left. Flow is going to pass down. Um, there's a separator skirt that actually, actually wraps around the cartridge. And I'll show you a good picture in a minute that, that gives you a better look at that. 
uh, but it's literally kind of a skirt that hangs down below that deck and provides a level of protection from any oil or scum or debris uh, from getting wedged inside those membranes. Um, and then obviously the uh, the heavy stuff that can sink, it's gonna go down to the bottom of the vault. Flow passes through those, those tentacles, if you will, from the outside radially. So it hits the surface, flows through the tentacle into the center of each of those tentacles. There is then a, a drainage channel that leads up to the top of the cartridge where flow is then discharged back up on top of the deck and heads out of the system. So I'm gonna fire this up and uh, I'll pause it a couple of times along the way here, but I'm gonna turn it over to this uh, automated voice for a second. Contact Engineered Solutions introduces the Jelly Filter, an engineered storm water treatment technology featuring pre-treatment and membrane filtration in a compact system. The jellyfish filter removes a high level and a wide variety of stormwater pollutants, such as fine particulates, oil, trash and debris, metals, and nutrients. Treatment begins as stormwater enters the jellyfish through the inlet pipe, builds driving head, and traps floating pollutants behind the maintenance access wall. Water is pushed down to the treatment chamber, where a separation skirt around the cartridges traps oil, trash, and debris outside the filtration zone and allows sand-sized particles to settle below the cartridges in the sump. Water is forced up from the treatment chamber through membrane filtration and into the backwash pool. So I want to just stop right there for a second, just to give you another kind of more in-depth talk on the, uh, the backwash pool and the, the drain-down cartridges I mentioned to you before. You can see the bulk of those cartridges kind of have that, 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 that little six inch high wall around them. And that's what they're referring to as the backwash pool. And uh, we've got, in this case, this is a fairly small system. So the one drain down cartridge located outside of the pool. And uh, what happens is, as head starts building on the system, you've got flow coming in. Uh, ultimately, that drain down cartridge will, will trickle flow uh, up until the point where this backwash pool fills. And then that, then all the cartridges are going to start spilling over and contributing to the effluent. And uh, what this pool really serves as is um, at the end of the storm event, when we've treated uh, you know, all the incoming flows and uh, the system's kind of reached an equilibrium, that pool of water is then able to push back through uh, the cartridges and uh, discharge out through the drain down cartridges, which are outside of that pool. So that's the passive backwash feature that we're, we're talking about when we speak about that. Once the water has filled the backwash pool, water overflows the wheel and exits via the outlet pipe. The high-performance membrane filtration provided by the jellyfish filter's pleated tentacles ensures long-lasting treatment and provides a large surface area to effectively remove fine sand and silt-sized particles and a high percentage of particulate-bound pollutants such as nitrogen, phosphorus, metals, and hydrocarbons. And then just last but not least, I already hit on this, but um, you know, this is, I mentioned, a fully passive filter. There's no reactive capacity to these membranes. Um, so when we're talking about removal of other pollutants outside of solid, it is strictly the particulate bound pollutants. And you know, I'll show you some data in a minute. It, there is actually a growing body of research that a, a fair amount of the uh, metals and nutrient load in stormwater is often associated with the particulate load. You know, often north of uh, 50%, you know, based on the, the data that's coming out for a number of these different systems, not just the jellyfish. Oh, whoops. I think we're just about at the end, but I will uh, see if I can skip Contact. it ahead for you. Caught in the backwash pool, flows back into the treatment chamber through the membrane cartridges. This passive backwash extends cartridge life and keeps them clear for future events. The drain down cartridge located outside the backwash enables water levels to balance. So, all right, just giving ahead, this is just some pictures I wanted to show you, give you, you know, sort of a real world view at some of these components and features. Um, start down in the bottom left corner of this slide. You know, that's a pretty standard manhole system. Uh, you've got a cartridge deck, you can see the, uh, the uh, backwash pool there around the bulk of those cartridges. This one's actually equipped with two drain down cartridges. Uh, you can see the maintenance um, access wall on the left. And uh, there's actually a standpipe inserted in this one, which is pretty common too for, for anything other than the smaller systems. 
uh, we'll use that standpipe as kind of a pressure relief and an emergency overflow if we ever got into a situation where you know the system was clogged and neglected uh, we certainly wouldn't want to create any uh, upstream issues uh, as a result of that so we do provide emergency relief in, in the majority of these systems to address that uh, moving up to the upper left pretty good view of that uh, that skirt that hangs down at the bottom of the deck your cartridges would be on the inside of that uh, again the intent is to keep you know the bulk of oils and greases and things that can really gum up filters uh, off of those uh, cartridge membranes and then uh, circling around top right similar type of view just looking right down into the maintenance access wall um, that is generally specified as, as large enough to uh, send a person down into too if there was ever an issue and someone needed to get down in there and uh, the last one on the bottom right you can see uh, crews in there installing excuse me the maintenance access wall and you know the um, drain down cartridges behind them as well as the uh, the standard cartridges in the drain down pool uh, a little further to the left from that and then that picture in the center is just looking down uh, the manhole view into a very small system that's just a two cartridge one drain down uh, system so it's probably a, a four foot diameter manhole most likely uh, for something that small moving along just a little bit about standard configurations uh, manholes are uh, very common you know for the smaller projects uh, we can scale up from anywhere from four foot diameter to 12 foot diameter manholes that's about the limit that uh, most precasters are making manholes these days and then there's certainly some structural limitations with the decks and things like that on uh, how big they can get um, but the general sort of just the size thing is once you know how deep you can go you know what your capacity is per cartridge and you can um, pick out the number of cartridges you needed based on your water quality flow um, we also do bolts when we get into big projects and we want to use jellyfish um, you know there's really um, you know quite a bit of ability to, to go pretty large with the vaults if there's a desire to do so we can also do you know multiple smaller units on sites as well if the, the, it more, makes more sense to disperse things uh, one of the nice things we can do with these vaults and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about you know online versus offline is that the jellyfish filter is typically an, an offline system it's not intended to uh, you know treat flows or have flows routed through it you know above its its water quality the capacity or water quality volume if you will um, but when we're working with a vault system, we can do what we call a peak diversion uh, design where we incorporate a bypass structure into the same uh, vault structure upstream of the treatment bag uh, so that we can route the water quality volume into the treatment bag and uh, bypass downstream without needing separate manhole junction manholes to do that. On the smaller end of things, uh, we can also design um, small curb and or graded inlet. Uh, catch basin style systems um, those are pretty limited in capacity I think they both max out at four four cartridges and a couple of drain downs uh, in a catch basin style configuration so as I mentioned uh, this is a pretty standard offline layout for say a manhole jellyfish system pretty common for a lot of stormwater systems when we're putting them offline um, but you know does require those junction structures um, you know when we're designing like this uh, the general approach is to design it so that you know we've got 18 inches of driving head available but between the uh, the crest of that uh, diversion manhole weir and uh, the outlet invert in the jellyfish system itself and then uh, you know we're returning flows uh, to a separate junction manhole so as i mentioned if we had a uh, vault design in play we can often put that vault in line and use kind of the peak diversion concept uh, to achieve this without those extra manholes which i know uh, oftentimes is appealing depending on whether you know there's constraints or space limitations or, or it can be a cost savings too um, from that perspective you know we do have online design tools and some automated design tools and i'll kind of steer you towards that but you know it's reasons like this is one of the reasons you know our, our operating rhythm is to have and prefer that before final designs are in place uh, people reach out to our design team um, just to make sure that we're, we're kind of checking all the boxes on what's possible and, and what makes most sense for the site. Switching gears a little bit, just talk about some general filter sizing stuff. I'm not going to get too deep into things. And uh, the jellyfish is a, a membrane filter. Um, so it's a fixed, you know, porosity, if you will. There, I'm sure there are different membranes, but uh, from a generic perspective, when we're talking about filter performance, you know, the type of media and often the gradation of media are going to be a major driver in, 
and how well that filter performs. Um, and we also, it's not, again, not so much an issue with a, uh, an inert membrane, but when we get into specialized media, uh, we want to make sure we're not setting ourselves up for leaching of previously captured pollutants or any sort of toxicity concerns. And, you know, I can tell you, you know, during the product development process, you know, we have come across granular media um, that we have found to have some uh, toxicity. So uh, it's not something that can really be overlooked. It may do a great job of filtering stormwater, but if it's toxic to, uh, uh, you know, whatever it be in bird macroinvertebrates or other things in your streams, it's not uh, not an ideal solution. So something to be aware of, you know, all things created equal, finer media does a better job at filtering, um, but at the finer the media, generally, um, the more rapidly it's going to clog. So it's always sort of a balance uh, that needs to be struck between those two things. Hydraulic loading rate is really going to, um, you know, be a key factor. As I mentioned, when we got started, um, really, the way these filters are designed and tested is to, you know, establish the hydraulic loading rate, you know, and it's usually expressed as a, a flux rate, or, um, you know, commonly in stormwater, that's known as gallons per, or expressed as gallons per minute per foot squared of media service area. And if you recall back, the jellyfish is pretty low; it's at 0.21 gallons per minute per foot squared of media service area. And we can keep it pretty low and still get quite a few bit of flow through these vaults because of all of that surface area we're able to add using a pleated membrane. Something like a granular cartridge filter, um, the loading rates tend to be a little higher because we have much less surface area, um, you know, per given cartridge. You know, within the stormwater industry, you know, the innovative stormwater industry, you know, or stormwater BMP, you know, world is probably a more uh, a better, more applicable term. Uh, we tend to see things between, you know, 0.05, very low hydraulic loading rates, all the way up as high as 10. You know, we've never uh, tested or achieved the kind of results, you know, we think are uh, are needed to meet modern stormwater regulations with anything approaching 10. Um, for some perspective, we have another filter name, known as the storm filter that's been around a long time. And uh, that one's set at two gallons per minute per foot squared. So, and that's a pretty coarse media. Filter longevity. Already mentioned this, um, but uh, you know this really comes into play when we're downstream of attenuation. You know whether it be a, a pond, some sort of underground storage structure. Um, it's very common because, especially in the eastern United States, where we get very intense rain events. You know if it's a small site, you know treating it in real time it is feasible, um, but it can become much more cost effective to attenuate that flow and slow release it from storage. Uh, because you need a much smaller filter downstream. However, we want to be mindful of the fact that all that water still has mass in it. And if we go too small with the filter downstream, uh, we end up clogging it very frequently. And that's something we try to avoid by switching to what we refer to internally as a mass load design. Um, and that's where through testing, we try to establish how much mass do these, these systems handle on a, on a per cartridge or per square foot of service area basis. You know, before they generally start to clog. Uh, like all things in stormwater, it's not perfect. We have to make you know estimates of that, and every site has you know different constraints. And if you've got um, you know a lot of oils or something unique going on in site, it certainly can change that math. But we do try to incorporate it into our logic to make sure we're not we're not setting ourselves up for a a, a giant maintenance burden right out of the chute because that can rapidly erase any savings you made on the actual install of the filter. <clears throat> so a little bit about performance. You heard Chris talking about tarp and tape, and that's exactly um, the programs that Jellyfish have been through. You know, if you want to talk to states that have programs like this to evaluate uh, innovative technologies, there's very few of them that will even even uh, open the door, so to speak, if you haven't been through tarp and, and now increasingly so tape. Um, for perspective, there's not that many differences between tarp and tape, other than that tape is, is probably a little more current. It's been updated several times. Both of them came out around the same time. Both of them are long-term field monitoring programs. So we're talking about going out in the field, collecting data over a year or more. Um, both of them have requirements for the minimum amount of storms you have to capture, data quality, you know, how many samples per storm, how much of the hydrograph do you have to cover. Uh, it's pretty involved stuff. It's pretty expensive stuff. Is um, you know one of the reasons why data reciprocity is gaining traction. 
you know, these are north of $200,000 when we're all in and we start talking about the fact that it's, it's usually done by third parties. All the sample analysis is done by third parties. Uh, so it adds up fast and it's not, it's not fast and it's not cheap. So, you know, being able to do credible data studies and then transfer that data um, and use the, the local rainfall, you know, for sizing is, is really becoming the norm within the stormwater world. So uh, the data that you're seeing on the screen here is from a TARP study done at the University of Florida under the uh, direction of John Sansaloni, who's done a lot of stormwater research over the years. Uh, you can see the system did perform very well down there, um, nearly 90% TSS, uh, approaching 60% total phosphorus, did pretty decent for total nitrogen on that site as well. You know, nitrogen is, is kind of a stormwater wild card and that results tend to vary a bit more than some of the other pollutants and uh, also did pretty well for metals. Um, you know, our experience is that when a system is doing a good job on particulate phosphorus, it usually does a good job on particulate metals too um, because they tend to bind, you know, to about the same size particle. We've got another study now out of, um, out of Oregon that was done under the tape protocol, as I just mentioned, and uh, very pleased to report uh, very similar results. It's always nice when you can uh, reaffirm what you saw on one site with uh, work done on another. Um, in that particular site, we actually exceeded 60% TP, similar nitrogen results and uh, similar TSS results. We weren't getting much metals on that site, so we uh, we don't have great metals data uh, just because we're getting non-detects for most of the storms. So those that didn't end up uh, getting reported through as part of the study. A uh, few things, just a few select certifications here. Um, put Rhode Island at the top of the list. That's probably the uh, the newest for the jellyfish. But you know, at this point, the jellyfish has been reviewed and uh, certified or verified or approved or whatever the local terminology is by the vast majority of programs, you know, in U.S. and Canada that actually have a, a formal list in place. Uh, both Maine and Vermont also have lists here in the Northeast. Um, we keep talking to Massachusetts and New Hampshire and hopeful they'll. Uh, um, you know, do something similar in the future as well. Uh, similarly, New York State, New Jersey, and then uh, down most of the Eastern Seaboard, Virginia, the Carolinas, uh, all have some form of approval and similarly out West. And so uh, the list is ever growing, but um, you know, the data really speaks for itself. Once we get through these, you know, difficult, long, expensive studies, usually allows us access to uh, you know, participate in stormwater management in most stormwater programs. So that's kind of the, the trade-off of doing a long, expensive field study, if you will. Maintenance, another little video clip here. That's a giant jellyfish tentacle. And I uh, want to let this play. You can see there's actually an attachment that you can, uh, unique to jellyfish, refurbish these tentacles and clean them out on site uh, versus doing a full replacement. I'll just let this play for a second. So stop that there. Um, if you've got a massive system with tons of cartridges, that can also be a, a you know pretty prolonged process. And um, you know, different folks prefer to do things differently. You can certainly um, do a full cartridge exchange. That increases the cost of a, any given maintenance, maintenance event, but it's it's certainly a viable one. You know there are instances where cartridges just wear out over time. We've had a couple of systems where they were neglected and or had very high solids loading and, and the cartridges actually kind of got buried in sediment and, and shredded up a bit. So that's, that's certainly not out of the realm of possibilities, but uh, we do work with some public works crews that, that do prefer to take systems back to their, uh, their maintenance facilities and, and clean them out themselves. You can do this work on site. It's a little bit messy, um, but if you've got the equipment and a small system, it's not at all out of the question to uh, to refurbish those cartridges on site. Um, generally speaking, it's all about uh, getting the cartridges, either replacing them or refurbishing them, uh, backing out the sump of the system, and then uh, getting the cartridges back in. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Obviously, the bigger the system, you know, the more involved the maintenance is going to be. Um, Contact doesn't actually provide maintenance services directly, but what we do do uh, you heard mention we do have a, a, a certified maintenance provider program uh, where we train them and certify they're they're quite qualified and understand our systems and all the components and what needs to take place. We've also trained 
you know, public works departments and DOTs and anyone else, you know, directly that wants, you know, hands-on training from us. We've got videos on that as well. Um, but we have a crew of folks, um, you know, kind of our field services team, you know, they're, they're responsible if something goes wrong during install um, or, you know, somebody wants maintenance training, you know, the, we do have a team of people that, that provides that service. So uh, I don't have time to go much deeper on maintenance today, but um, sort of a quick primer on, on how jellyfish is cleaned. And then last but not least for me, um, I mentioned at the start of this that, you know, our ultimate preference, you know, before the project is, you know, in, in final design is that you do reach out and, and engage with our team. And we've got on-site engineers assigned to each state. So, you know, we've got a what we call a stormwater design engineer and a, a stormwater consultant that are unique to Rhode Island, familiar with all the rules there, the design requirements, what's approved, all the nuances, you know, in the letter that Chris pointed out, then they're going to be you know, sort of your resources to walk any given project through from, from design to install. Uh, but there are a lot of tools on our website. We've got, you know, a um, we've got design tool worksheets, DYOS tools if you just need a quick, you know, estimate of what you're dealing with. Um, all the technical documentation, more in-depth maintenance, um, you know, more in-depth information on system performance. And uh, this is true of all of our technologies. So, if you're ever looking for you know, basic information, that's the place to start, you know, short of calling one of us up. So I believe that is it for me. And uh, I think we're on to our next question and answer session. That looks like we have one question that uh, was left over. I'm assuming it's for DEM. It says, can you discuss again the reciprocity with Massachusetts uh, or the lack of reciprocity as it relates I'm assuming to certification. Um, yeah, so so I don't know of any um, system that Massachusetts really has in place um, for that. I believe that they just kind of work with municipalities um, on a case by case basis. Um, but yeah, like I, I said, can, the, I can speak to it a little from our perspective because I've spent a lot of time over the years engaging with Mass and. You know, we're, they're, they're an interesting place in that they're not a delegated state. So EPA Region 1 uh, also has a role there and the municipalities, all the MS4s roll up, you know, under EPA Region 1's umbrella. Um, and the state does have some uh, authority through their wetlands rules. And um, as far as innovative technologies and reciprocity goes, Mass used to have the Mass Step database um, that was up for a long time. It was housed on UMass Amherst website. And they had a whole bunch of technologies like this. Jellyfish was on that, um, as were a number of other things. Uh, but that got defunded uh, geez, five or six years ago now. Uh, and it's kind of created a bit of an impasse. So uh, I know I think Eric and Chris mentioned you guys are talking with them, but we're talking a lot about them offering some new form of reciprocity along these lines. Um, right now, they use a lot of these types of systems in Massachusetts. The tricky part, or, or maybe more so the, uh, the the frustrating part at times, is that it often has to go to a project by project review. Currently, uh, they don't have a fully established list that you can just say you're good to go with these if you size them properly. So uh, that's sort of where it stands. They're they're absolutely allowed, and depending on which municipality you're working in, they have different preferences and uh, different nuances, but. Um, they're using everything from the pre-treatment practices and catch basin inserts to more advanced filters, um, but they haven't got a fully functioning, you know, sort of approved list at the moment. Okay, thank you. Uh, here's a couple other questions that are, can be combined as one. Uh, how do you dispose of cartridge cleanings and is the cartridge uh, Set of excess sediment stuff washed back into the unit onto the ground. Yeah, yeah you do need to dispose of that as you would, you know, any catch basin or, or stormwater sediment, if you will. You know, every state's got slightly different rules, and I'm not a Rhode Island disposal expert, but no, you need to retain that sediment and uh, dispose of it properly as it, as you would any sort of catch basin waste or, or four bay waste or anything you take out of your your stormwater BMPs. And I know states do have usually some testing requirements and if you trip over you know if you had contaminated sediment for example with really high metals concentrations or something like that or or you had an oil spill um, that can kind of change the game but um, yeah all that stuff you backed out of the sump and, and all that sediment 
you, you wash off the cartridges does need to be retained and probably disposed of nightmare. Okay, yeah, it doesn't look like we have any further questions at the moment, but yeah, feel free uh, audience to put them into the into the question section. Um, and we do have time allotted at the end of the uh, next two presentations as well. So we can pick those up again later, but we'll move on to Hernan Peralta's presentation next. Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Herman Peralta. I'm a technical manager with Warning Current. So for the first case study, um, we're going to talk about uh, a project in College Hill, uh, specifically Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, so the, the site itself, um, it's pretty pretty small, uh, congested. Um, the runoff from the site, um, you know, uh, discharges into the uh, city separate stormwater. Uh, that ultimately outfalls to Providence River, which is an impaired water body for both bacteria and um, nitrogen. So that was kind of our uh, uh, pollutants of concern uh, when designing these BMPs. Um, so we knew into, you know, going into the project that the uh, the site is very congested with utilities. Um, we, you know, we knew that there's poor uh, soil conditions. Um, we had some steep slopes that we had to work with um, based on our um, project um, experience around um, that area. And, you know, with the existing conditions coming in, as well as understanding what the proposed building footprint is going to look like, um, that kind of confirmed that, you know, um, designing for a, and implementing a more traditional BMP would be impractical. So what we did is we we you know turned to the approved uh, uh, list um, from DEM, um, and at that time, as Chris mentioned, there were only two uh, treatment that was pre-approved as a standalone system. Um, one of them, obviously, is the gelfish filter, and the other one was a modular wetland. Um, so we ended up uh, selecting the gelfish filter um, for you know, really uh, main reason was that it um, was uh, had a smaller a footprint than the module wetland um, because it's because of its uh, vertical uh, orientation. Um, so the the system is you know, we ended up designing a JF6, which is a six foot diameter uh, gelfish system with I think uh, seven cartridges uh, in the unit. Um, and the system was designed to treat the one inch treatment depth over uh, eight tenths of an acre of uh, drainage area, uh, mostly impervious combination of roof pavement, uh, as well as hardscape areas. So during the design process, you know, a couple of things to consider, and they, I think um, a couple of the presenters has already mentioned, um, like all uh, treatment system, um, we, we you know, want to consider whether or not it's an offline and online system. Obviously, offline would be recommended. Um, for a proprietary structure, that you know, uh, again, offline is recommended. It avoids having to oversize the structure um, to bypass larger flows. Um, for our project, uh, we had to design it as an online for a couple reason reasons. So one of them was the fact that the the site was very congested with with utilities, so we didn't have any room for a diversion structure and a bypass um, pipe. And so, and and the fact that the drainage area was, you know, less than an acre, so it was small enough that we could design this an online system to allow uh, peak flows of about four CFS to um, bypass through the system. Um, so, as you, if you had to design it as an online, do consider the higher head loss through the structure compared to a manhole. Um, uh, standard uh, drainage manhole um, because again there's a built-in weir system in the unit uh, that could potentially create uh, that additional head loss through the system. And like most proprietary structures they are designed um, um, based on a war quality full parameter. So a couple of things you, um, as the designers to, to size the system. One is um, you can just refer to that table that Chris had um, referenced in his presentation to size the system. Um, looks like there's a, you know, it, the sizing was based on, you know, impervious area as well as water quality flow. 
Second option, you could you request uh, contact to, you know, do the calculation for you, and that's then that's what we did uh, for this project. Uh, we sent a contact, uh, the drainage area, percent impervious, as well as a treatment depth, and um, they were able to provide us a calculation worksheet that shows uh, water quality flow calculations. Um, thirdly, um, what you could uh, do to um, calculate water quality flow, you can just use the equation that's prescribed in the manual um, that's based off of the TR55 methodology to convert water quality volume to uh, water quality flow. Uh, other considerations here is, you know, the number of the number and angles of inlet pipes. So um, for our project, we had two inlet pipes um, with a kind of an awkward um, angle, um, but it was great that the, the structure was able to accommodate uh, the very tight angle between the inlet pipes. Um, and all these design elements, uh, again, the uh, good benefit about uh, working with contact is, you know, a lot of these design elements uh, can be worked out with, with contact with, with their assistance. Um, uh, kind of last slide here, uh, the photo to your right is the actual unit that was installed. Um, the project is still in construction. Um, completion, I believe, is next year. Um, so one of the limits that we found with this uh, um, unit is that be, because it has a fat, uh, flat slab, um, there's not much, um, it's limited to field adjustments if you have to, for example, lower the structure. Um, so what we did for this project, um, and actually the, for the project, we, the, the system was located um, at a prominent uh, uh, area and the landscape architect that we work with uh, didn't want to see the casting uh, because it's going to be very visible. So part of the design was to um, install these wonder covers um, and, um, and the, the, the wonder covers would sit on top of the actual casting of the um, unit um, and that wonder cover essentially would match the hardscape uh, area. Um, to kind of hide it um, below below the surface. And in order for us to allow flexibility in the um, field adjustments for the site contractor um, is we, we set the the um, the castings about eight to twelve inch eight to twelve inches below the um, finished grade. so that if we they had to lower the grade, um, they wouldn't have to make any adjustments they'll have eight to 12 inch of a uh, play to, um, to use. However, if we had to raise the grade, then we can use bricks or concrete collars to raise those, um, those um, castings. And another installation note is, you know, when the, the system get, gets delivered on the site, it has all the internal components except for the filter cartridges itself. Um, and so that, so once the site um, is stabilized, that's when either the site contractor or the owner would then reach out to contact to um, initiate that delivery of the um, cartridges. So that was kind of a quick case study at um, Providence. Again, it was pretty straightforward design with contact. Um, they were very helpful and you know, through the design process, um, we were able to uh, manage a lot of the you know challenges that we face with this site um, just because it's you know again it's um, ultra urban very congested um, but overall we you know uh, went pretty smooth as far as designing it with contact with that said I'd like to uh, turn over to Brian for the next case study Thank you. All right, I'm going to talk about two different projects. Uh, the first project is Project Schooner, which is located in Johnson, Rhode Island. It's right on Hartford Avenue. It's right next to like the intersection of 295 and Hartford Ave. So this is a proposed, it's a large industrial building, 800,000 square feet plus footprint, associated parking, includes extensive improvements to Hartford Avenue, needed safety improvements, widening of over 4,000 feet of Hartford Avenue. And the big problems that we have with this type of site is we're in an impaired waterway, so we're impaired for bacteria and copper. High groundwater, high ledge, like most sites, honestly. Uh, steep slopes, 
So infiltration areas on the site are very limited. And then with uh, the Hartford Ave improvements, we've got uh, the widening, which is all new impervious area. We've got existing impervious area that's not treated. And we are in a limited right of way. So really not a lot of room to do things. So we propose jellyfish in a couple different uses on this project. Uh, one use to help increase the pollutant removal across the site was, was added to traditional BMPs. So actually the middle picture here, we actually added it to an underground sand filter. Our infiltration wasn't possible, so we couldn't get the pollutant removals we needed. We added on a jellyfish to help get those uh, rates up. And then to other areas along Hartford Avenue and uh, other limited areas like, you know, when your entranceways and stuff go towards main roadway, it's usually very limited right away, limited room to do things. We added jellyfishes at those locations to maximize water quality to really the maximum extent gave us an opportunity to treat as much as we could on Hartford Avenue, as well as from the proposed and purpose from our site. Next project I want to mention real quickly here is Tidewater Landing in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. So this one's actually located right on the Seekonk River. And this was a former contaminated site. So it was a old manufactured gas plant. And it's abandoned and clear today, but it needs to be remediated and capped. So once again, we got a site that's a long impaired waterway, can't infiltrate, and um, we're impaired for bacteria and nitrogen again, nitrogen again. So obviously with any impaired waterway, any increase of impervious area just causes all sorts of havoc with pollutant loading analysis. So this is where the jellyfish kind of comes in to help get um, the rules that we need. And this site, just like every other site, especially in urban area, actually I'll go back up one, you know, we're maximizing the site to everything. This is right in Pawtucket, it's right very urban, and it's the proverbial 10 pounds of stuff in a five pound bucket, probably two pounds on this site. So the jellyfish really was useful on this site because we have a city drainage line that comes right through the middle of the site that actually has probably close to 10 acres of, of stormwater coming to it, with eight acres being impervious. We were able to take that to an offline configuration and with a 16 by eight foot structure, which is a really, really small footprint, able to treat those eight acres of impervious area and get down to the pollutant loading that we actually need. So this is where we see the real big benefit in the jellyfish is those you know, really tight spots, really hard to reach areas, you know, really treating that maximum extent practicable because it can do it in a really small footprint and not really um, be too much of a, a problem getting it to fit on the site. And that's my two quick case studies. I want to pass it back to Ryan. Okay. Thank you, uh, both Hernan and Brian, for sharing uh, yeah, some of your lessons learned and uh, when implementing a jellyfish filter. It does look like we just have one question for Hernan uh, about some specifics of where exactly on the Brown campus uh, that the project was located. Yes, the, the project was for the Performance Arts Center. Um, again, still in construction, uh, completion is uh, next year. Okay, okay. Okay, well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions at the moment. Well, we got some more coming in. Last minute, where did that one go? Uh, here's one about uh, what are some general costs of the jellyfish filter units? That would probably be directed towards Derek. Yeah, it's hard for me to give you a, a, a real defined answer on that one. I don't know the, the modern price list, if I'm being 100% honest, but uh, it's safe to say there's uh, economies of scale. And by that, I mean, you know, if you just need a couple of cartridges, um, you know, it's, it's a few thousand dollars type of thing. But, uh, you know, when you get into the massive systems, the per cartridge cost starts to go down. Um, but, you know, similar to, uh, you know, a lot of these innovative PMPs, they're, they're not cheap per se. Um, you're certainly paying in some cases to save save that space. But if you wanted to reach out to me, I can put you in touch with our stormwater consultant who can start to hone you in on ballpark price lists for different type systems and stuff like that. I, I don't have that information right, right at my fingertips. Okay. Uh, here's another one that says, how has recent economic conditions affected pricing and lead times? For these lead times for us right now aren't too bad. We're kind of watching summer, you know, depending on where these things are being shipped from, you know, trucking delays and things like that have been uh, slowing down. And we've seen a little bit of, of uh, slowdown on, with some of our precasters in certain parts of the country. But 
Uh, no question, there's been some material cost increases. Um, jellyfish isn't as impacted. Uh, where we've really taken a hit the last year or two is on steel. Um, we do corrugated steel pipe, so that has actually increased quite a bit in price, but so far, jellyfish has not uh, felt that kind of pressure. Okay. Now, I don't see any more questions coming in. Um, if anybody in the audience, uh, if they do have questions, you can uh, contact me at the Providence Stormwater Innovation Center, and I will make sure that uh, the, your questions get out to the presenters so that they can provide an answer, answer back to you. Uh, after the web webinar today, we will be sending out a, a survey. If you can take a little bit of time to fill that out, that will, the results of that survey will help us in developing uh, future content and future webinars and just stay tuned on our website uh, for to get a, a an idea of when these next webinars and other events and trainings will be will be coming out so thanks everybody all the presenters and the organizers and thank you everyone for attending today hey, thanks everybody bye thank you yeah thank you